We're going to be in Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let's pray together. Father, you know how how heavy this text has been to my soul, what burden I've carried here today. I pray, Lord, that you would write this text upon our ministries, that you'd sear it with a hot iron. Pray that once we have seen it, that we will not be able to unsee it. And I pray, Lord, that many souls will be able to be shepherded because of this one verse. So do more in this time than I could do with days of preaching. We need you to be here with us, so please be here with us now. In Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So our topic is soul care. Our single verse is Hebrews thirteen seventeen. And my hope for this time is that this one verse would mark your ministry wherever God calls you. I'm praying that immortal souls will be blessed because you believe Hebrews 13, 17. So that is what we're going to do. We're going to take it in two parts. First, the pastor's business. What is the pastor's business? What do we do? Second, the pastor's report. So the pastor's business, and we'll spend most of our time here, and then the pastor's report. As we go through, I want to draw in pastor's voices from the past. I want to bring a a great cloud of witnesses, you might say, to come and cheer us along as we go forth in the ministry as we go forth in the work. And so I'm going to be quoting probably more than usual, and so I hope that that's a blessing to your souls. So first, the pastor's business, what is it? Look with me. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. The pastor's business is to keep watch over souls. To watch over them. As a doctor deals with the body, so the pastor deals with the soul. We keep watch over souls. John Owen summarizes it this way. Keep watch over souls as if it were said, The work and design of these rulers is solely to take care of your souls, by all means to preserve them from evil, sin, backsliding, to instruct and feed them, to promote their faith and obedience, that they may be safely led to their eternal rest. For this end is their office appointed and here do, herein do they labor continually. Herein they labor continually. I'm currently on my way to Mordor, uh, traveling through the two towers, and I came along the Ents, these majestic trees that are ensouled, and they're called by Tolkien, shepherds of the trees. Shepherds of the trees. Now, brothers, we are not shepherds of the trees. Though Adam was once a shepherd of trees. But we have a higher calling upon us. 
the ants protected their wooded brethren from orcs and dwarves. But we protect souls from sin, Satan, damnation, judgment. So while the ants are shepherds of the trees, pastors are shepherds of the soul. Do you feel the weight of that? Do you feel it? Souls, do you feel the weight of that word? Does it have its full meaning with you? Or are we too entish ourselves seeing immortal, eternal souls and immortal, eternal men as trees walking? Do you see, brothers, the weight of souls? You labor over that man or that part of the man, that part of the woman, that part of the child, that shall live forever. That is the pastor's work. Lemuel Haynes puts it bluntly, the man who does not appreciate the worth of souls is not greatly affected with their dangerous situation, is not qualified for the sacred office. The dangerous situation, the weight and the worth of immortal souls. Notice we are discussing here, as we think about keeping watch over souls, we're discussing the work of a pastor and not just a preacher. A pastor and not just a preacher. Watching over souls entails receiving information and giving it. When many think of pastoring, they think of standing up front. They think of putting on the mic. They think of having the Bible open and speaking. But how many think of the quiet hours, alone with a sinner, a sufferer, an unsatisfied soul, hearing them, asking questions, correcting, rebuking when necessary. House after house with family after family. Is that what you think of when you think of a pastor? We want to spend time with Paul and the Puritans, but what about our people? Paul went from house to house, we read in Acts 20. And the Puritan Richard Baxter said things like this. It is too common for men to think that the work of ministry is nothing but to preach and to baptize and to administer the Lord's Supper and to visit the sick. Too many ministers are such strangers to their own calling. How little they do for the saving of souls except only in the pulpit. They have hundreds of people that they never spoke a word to personally for the salvation of their souls. Pastoral work, it has been said, is the application of your public ministry to individuals in private. It's application of your sermons, the rephrasing of them in the private with souls, pleading with them, pleading with them. And this is a glorious work. It not only offers them sermons, but it offers them our very selves. And it knits us together with our people. We see this somewhat with Paul as he discusses not only the highs of teaching and preaching, but both the highs and the lows of this kind of ministry, of being diligent, of being knitted together with his people. He says, God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Can you say that? Is there anybody in your life that you can say that about? 
And then next we see him, I am in the pain of childbirth again over you. And then even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, even so I rejoice and am glad and would have you rejoice with me. And then again, for now we live. For now we live. If you are standing fast in the Lord. Is your life tied up with whether your people are standing fast in the Lord? Is this what you envision when you think of aspiring to the pastorate? It could be death to me. If my people fall away. There could be death to me. That is the voice of not only a preacher, but one who lived among the people and was among them day and night, admonishing them with tears in his eyes. As we read in Acts 20. The true portrait of the Christian pastor, Charles Bridges tells us, is among the folds of the flock. Encouraging, warning, directing, instructing as a counselor, ready to advise, as a friend to aid, sympathize, and console. With the affection of a mother to lift up the weak. With the long-suffering of a father to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Such a one really lives in the hearts of his people and will do more for their temporal and spiritual welfare than men of the most splendid talents and commanding eloquence. Do you believe that? Maybe you're wondering, how do I do this work? I want to be in the, the hearts of my people. I want to be involved in this. Practically, I think this kind of pastoral work, this soul, this keeping watch over souls has at least three things involved. First, know them. First, know them. Second, feed them. Feed them. And third, warn them. So know them, feed them, warn them. First, know them. Brothers, souls need watching over. Souls need watching over. How, fluctuate, how fluctuating are our own Christian walks? How in need constantly of oversight and updating. And to think the pastor not only cares for one soul, which would be enough, <laughs> but is simultaneously trying to care for dozens at the same time. So see him there. Some are, are down drawing swords with Apollyon. Others are panting, climbing hill difficulty. Others are Neek, neck deep in the slew of despond. A few feast in the palace beautiful, but more are window gazing in Vanity Fair. And there are more than a few getting beat up by giant despair. Flat, flatterer, excuse me, seduces. Demas beckons. Well, Lord, hate good is still hating good. What few aids we have to the celestial city. What towering impossibilities do we face, and yet how needful are pastors. How needful are watchers over souls to get us to our eternal rest. The pastor must, and the pastoral team, must regularly acquaint themselves with each member's state. Paul commands, pay careful attention to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To all the flock, not a select few, not your favorite ones. Careful attention, not occasional glances. And how do we do this without being with them? 
How do you do this work without being with them? Inquiring into their love for Christ, their time in the word and prayer, their fellowship within the church, the presence of family worship in their homes or not. Do you know your people? Do you know where their souls are? Oh, brothers, eat meals and prepare to eat meals. Do this now. Eat meals together. Pray together. Sing together. And open up the word of God together. Develop care sheets and organize your prayer lives so that none fall through the cracks. Make time to counsel and be intentional to press past the life updates and the surface prayer requests, as good as those are, to how is it with their souls? How is their walk with Jesus? Are they increasing in grace or are they declining? Are they still heaven bound? Where are they? How are they doing? So the first thing that we must do is, is know them. The second thing is feed them. So now you know them. Now you have some information. What do you do next? Well, in verse 7 of the same chapter, we read, Remember your leaders, so the same leaders in 17, those who spoke to you the word of God. What do you feed them with? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. We feed with the word of God. These are the men, these leaders here, are the ones who say, said, thus saith the Lord, and behold your God. Oh, brothers, to have his word, not just to bring it into the pulpit to preach it, though we love doing that, but to sit with these saints and to hear and have them expose to you the raw wounds of their soul and for you to clean it and apply to it the balm of God's word. Caesarius of Arles gives us an example of this when he writes this. The, the minister applies heavenly remedies saying to each sinner, do not be proud, brother, because it is written, God resists the proud. Do not be angry because we read, anger lodges in the bosom of a fool. And again, the wrath of God does not work the justice of God. If they perchance see disobedience, they say kindly and humbly, do not be disobedient, brother, because it is written, obey your superiors and be subject to them, for they keep watch as having to render an account of souls. If by speaking well, he recognizes that he is Christ's helper and a defender of justice, let him rejoice and give thanks to God. And with him, help and persevere and counsel him to persevere till the end for not he who has begun, but he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. And so you have the need and then you have the corresponding word that must be delivered to that soul. So brothers, store up the word of God in your hearts. Don't just lend a listening ear, but offer a scripture speaking mouth to what you have heard. Even now you can do that with your families. You can do that in your churches. You can do that with the mailman as you hear speak the word of God. And then thirdly, so we have know them, feed them the word of God. And then thirdly, warn them. The sightseeing here, the keeping watch over souls, is not a sightseeing tour. Elders watch from the high tower as watchmen given description in Ezekiel. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you will surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. We are not at peace 
a holy war rages and our enemy cannot even spell surrender. Lemuel Haynes described it this way. The work of the office of gospel ministers suggests the idea of enemies invading and danger approaching. When soldiers are called forth, the sentinels stand upon the wall. It denotes war. The soul and the souls of men are environed with then thousands of enemies that are seeking their ruin. Earth and hell are combined together to destroy. How many already have fallen victims to their ferocity? The infernal powers of, are daily dragging their prey to the prison of hell. That's the context of the, of the pastor, of the gospel minister. And so we must warn men, women, and children. We cannot be blind watchmen, silent dogs who cannot bark, as Isaiah describes. Pretend not to love them, corrects Richard Baxter, if you favor their sins and seek not their salvation. If you be their best friend, help them against their worst enemies. Ministers must know, ministers must feed, and ministers must warn. So I want to give just a, a brief application for those who are aspiring here, aspiring to do that kind of work. What can you do? I'll add more applications to very good ones that have already been suggested. One could be care about the souls around you. See souls as souls. See where they're going to be in 100 years from now. Consider it. Think about it. Allow that to, lo to make you lose sleep at night. But very specifically from our text, care especially for your pastor's soul. As you are a pre-pastor, care about your pastor's soul. Do you see it with me in the text? Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your soul as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no profit to you. Our text is not written directly to pastors. It's written to the whole church. The whole church needs to wake up to this reality of what their pastors are doing. But I think it's especially helpful for pre-pastors. Some of us pre-pastors, some of you pre-pastors, have a lot of opinions and thoughts of how, the, how it should be going in, your, in the ministries that you're under, right? You have a lot of convictions. You're up and coming leaders. But some of you need to know, some of you need to be reminded that you need to be obeying your pastors, submitted to your pastors. Yes, there are convictional hills that we should die upon, but do you know which ones they are? Is everyone one of those hills to you? Brothers, are you, are you, a, are you a steerable sheep? Are you eager to be known? Are you eager to be fed? Are you eager to be warned? Are you a shepherd's in sheep's clothing? Are you a watchdog? that barks every time the decision was executed in a way that you would not have done that? Brothers, consider that they keep watch over your souls. They keep watch over your souls. Don't make their job harder than it already is. Be an asset to their ministry. Let him do this work this eternal work, this trembling work, this hard and sad and sometimes lonely work. Allow them to do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no profit to you. So we have the minister's business, 
I hope you accidentally memorized the text already. Keep watch over souls. But second, we have the pastor's report. The pastor's report. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as, as those who will have to give an account. As those who will have to give an account. John Chrysostom was disquieted by this part of the text. As for the passage, obey them that have rule over you and submit to them, for they watch on behalf of your souls as they will have to give an account. Though I have mentioned it once already, yet I will break silence about it now, for the fear of its warning is continually agitating my soul. The fear of its warning is continually agitating my soul. Under shepherds are accountable shepherds. Three verses later, Jesus is called the great shepherd of the sheep. In 1 Peter 5, he's called the chief shepherd. We do not think enough about the trial which each man will have to undergo, says Charles Spurgeon, or of that account which all under shepherds will have to render in the last great day. It is written, if the watchmen warn them not, they shall perish, but their blood I will require at the watchman's hands. Oh, my master, when thou searchest my garments for the blood of souls, grant that I may be found clear of all the blood of men. Oh, what a heaven that will be. Oh, what a heaven that will be. And that's Paul in Acts 20. When he gathers with the Ephesian elders, I declare to you this day I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Brothers, we please be innocent of the blood of those under your care. Let us consider, just very briefly, both negatively and positively, that account. What could it look like? So Spurgeon says, let us consider it together. Well, let's consider it together. First, Dr. Doddridge writes this. It is a tragic spectacle to behold a criminal dying by human laws, even where, even where the, the methods of execution are gentle. So this is a scene of an execution. And I doubt not, but it would grieve us to, to, to the heart to see any who we had been laboring over in the ministry in such a deplorable circumstance. But oh, but oh, how, how much more deeply must it pierce our very souls to see them led forth to that dreadful execution with those of whom Christ shall say, as for those, as for those mine enemies who would not have that I reign over them, bring them forth before me and slaughter them. Oh, how will it wound us to hear the beginning of those cries and wailings, which must never end? How shall we endure the reflection? These wretches are perishing forever in part, because I would not take any pains to attempt their salvation. May we not see that. May we not consider that on that day.
And then lastly, on the other side of that, contemplation. Opposite of that, Lemuel Haynes paints for us the positive. Ministers will meet the pious part of their congregations. So now those who are saved. They'll meet the pious part of their congregations with great rejoicing. With great rejoicing, especially those to whom they had, they had been instrumental in saving good. Such will be the minister's own crown of rejoicing in the day of the Lord Jesus. Ministers and their people, when they have finished their course, will remember those Bethel visits they have enjoyed in the sanctuary around the Lord, in the table of the Lord, in the sweet counsel they had taken together. They will remember the seasonable reproofs given to each other, and whatever differences have taken place between them will all be forgiven and forever exterminated. They will see the wisdom and the goodness of God in all of these things. Thus, when the ministers of Christ have finished their course, that will put an end to all their troubles, and so their ministry will end on issue in their unspeakable joy and consolation. Unspeakable joy and consolation. Imagine being together with your people and hearing and overhearing sheep after sheep. Well done, good and faithful servant. And you know that under God, you played a part in that. You were used by the Lord in that to bring one home safely. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? I want that. May that be our great sight as we gather together with our people on that great day. So let me pray that for us now. So Father, I pray that we would, those of us who are already pastors, that we would take more seriously than we have this great charge. I pray that those who are aspiring to this great work would really consider what they are doing because they will give an account for how they pastored. Help us to keep watch over souls. Help us to gather together on that great day with our people and say, praise the Lord for his kindness that we are here and we made it. We persevered to the end and thank the Lord for his great design of church, sheep, and under shepherds and great shepherd. And so please, take this one verse, not the only verse, but take this one verse and mark us with it. May we never be able to unsee it. May we give an account on that day that we heard this verse and we obeyed it, not being hearers only, but doers of the word. You are good. You are a good shepherd. You are the chief shepherd. You are the great shepherd. And we love you. And we know that there is mercy in you still. And we ask for it. So please meet us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.